just wanted to know a little background about your about your book, The Ships of the World, an encyclopedic history, and how you've come to how you've come across or come to writing a book on the sea and civilization, right from material history as in shipbuilding, the kind of ships that traverse the oceans, to writing a history of the sea, literally, from 10,000 years ago to the present. Well, I started with um, the, f the focus on ships because that's what I knew. Uh, I started going to maritime museums when I was a child, mm -hmm. and I grew up uh, around maritime preservation movement uh, in the United States. And I worked for Maritime History Magazine that focused a lot on ship preservation. So it seemed logical um, to, to write an encyclopedia of historic ships because there are so many ships that are well known, um, but that are really otherwise unrelated except the fact that they are ships. Mm -hmm. So you would have things like Jacques-Yves Cousteau's Calypso or the Titanic or right. the, the Bismarck or um, the Exxon Valdez or the Amaco Cadiz or the um, ships that Tor Heyerdahl built to mm -hmm. um, test out his theories of pre-industry, early navigation. Or you would have ocean liners. Um, so the idea was to create an, a a one-stop reference that would cover the thousand or so most famous ships that people were likely to be interested in. So I did that, and as I did that, it seemed logical to think that this might preserve or present the uh, framework for a maritime history of the world, because a lot of the ships that I also included were archaeological sites. So those were very important for uh, helping people understand early trade routes or the early developments of uh, shipbuilding techniques. But the problem was that the preponderance of evidence came from the West, the Mediterranean, the North Atlantic, Europe, and, and the United States, or it was very modern. So uh, really since 1500, but um, in particular for East Asia and South Asia, you know, even the 20th and late 19th centuries. So the next stop was, well, how do you, how do you sort of flesh out this skeleton that's just so lopsided in one direction? And to that end, I began reading a lot of secondary sources and, and histories of seas and basins. You know, there are lots of histories, or several histories of the Indian Ocean, of the Pacific, of the Atlantic, of the North Sea and Baltic, the Mediterranean, of course, with uh, Baudel. And, um, but even that all tended to be sort of weighted towards periods that were already well covered. So uh, for the Indian Ocean, it tended to be since the Portuguese intervention. Um, and I was really interested in exploring uh, the roots of the question of why was it possible for the Portuguese to get from Mombasa to Calicut in a couple of weeks, three weeks, I think, uh, when it had taken them m uh, decades to get down the coast of West Africa. And the answer to that was that as they started going down the coast of West Africa, they were among uh, Arab traders and they could communicate with them because people spoke Arabic and Portuguese. Then they got past the zone of Arab intervention and all of a sudden they were in a land where they had to stop, learn the language, talk to the people, figure out what happened next, and then proceed. And so that, took, that slowed things down. When they rounded Africa, they got back into the zone of the, the Muslim um, Arab-speaking world, and boom, they were off and running. They could, they could follow directions. They, they knew uh, where they were because these sea routes had been thoroughly developed for millennia. And I was very curious about well, what is the evidence for that? And the evidence for that is not ships. It's not archival material. It's more in the nature of um, ethnographic evidence, um, some shipbuilding techniques, uh, the evidence of certain crops from Africa uh, that originated in Indonesia and were brought by um, uh, Austronesian navigators across the Indian Ocean. And so um, the next step was to, beyond that, to look at the literature of India, um, the Gitas, the um, Arthashastra, the Manasmirti, um, the Tamil epics, um, and also the Jatakas, which have some wonderful stories about um, Indians going uh, from the west coast or maybe east coast of India to uh, Indonesia and, and the Malay Peninsula. And so it was an accretion of evidence 
and teasing out how to put it all together to tell a coherent story. And the Indian Ocean was probably the most difficult in that respect because it's got the longest and deepest and most involved history. Um, but it also was a problem for other regions. But the Indian Ocean is really where I sort of cut my teeth on that kind of multivalent research. Uh, Linford, what do you feel about, uh, in your first book on the ships, uh, you didn't cover anything concerning the Bombay shipyards, the East India Company ships that were built in Bombay, or the Royal Navy ships that were built in Bombay, the teak built ships, which mm -hmm. we're all very proud about. Yeah. So, is there any kind of coverage in your book on that aspect? Not as much as I w there probably should be, or mm -hmm. as much as I would have liked, partly because um, the ships weren't as well known in terms of sort of the popular imagination. Probably better known in India than they are in, um, in the West, obviously. But I think that there, there's an appreciation of the ships as a, as, um, as a tradition of shipbuilding but less interest in individual ships for events that they were involved in. And what I was deeply engaged in in writing the um, encyclopedia was the ships that had stories that people knew and trying to, con to, con to consolidate the information about them so that they would know basically what the story is and so that there would be sources for them to follow. I think there are some uh, teak built ships and I don't want to say their names because in, I'll invariably get it wrong. Um, well, I'll try. I think the Jellum was one, perhaps, right, uh, in, right. in the Royal Navy. So that's in there. Um, and there are some others, I believe. But uh, I also talk about uh, ships, as you know, like the Komagata Maru, mm -hmm. which was a story which I didn't know until I was doing the research. And I came across it, and I thought, well, this is a, a fascinating window into a critical point in, in, in Indian history and, and in British imperial history. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, was a, it was a great process of learning and discovery. Uh, in terms of writing the Sea and Civilization, did you actually uh, uh, use oral history? Besides the archival, as in the manuscripts and ethnography, the uh, Jataka tales, the Manusmriti and the Arthashastra that you mentioned, uh, is there any reference to oral history to write about this part of the world, the Indian Ocean? Oral history? Oral history as in shipbuilding communities, mm -hmm. you know? Um, uh, not, if, if there was, I wasn't aware of it at the time. Okay. And so I, I relied primarily on, I would say, secondary sources. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I preferred sources, secondary sources that drew on archival material, but um, you know, very often the stories just aren't told that way, uh, or there were no archives to begin with. So sometimes you would rely on letters or personal memoirs. According to you, in the CN civilization, uh, which event or which aspect of Indian Ocean history is really stands out for you? Uh, well, there are a lot. Obviously, the arrival of the Portuguese. Um, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that um, in, in American and European and English studies, William the Conqueror sailing from Normandy to, to Britain, which is about 25 miles, uh, gets so much play when 40 years before the Cholas sailed from um, Nagapatanam to uh, Sumatra, which is about 1,500 miles. Um, Nobody knows about that. Nobody, nobody knows about that. And I think that's just a travesty of historical mismanagement. Um, but also the Indus Valley civilization's trade with the, uh, Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. I think is a, it's a valuable story um, that if, if it were properly situated and, and properly known, would, I think, help re reinforce a different worldview than we generally have. So what you're trying to say is actually even so many years after uh, historians from the subcontinent and Asia are trying to turn the perspective around and make it sort of more Indian Ocean centric rather I mean since the time of uh, 
quite a few, like Brodel, for instance, trying to make it sort of more Indian Ocean centric. Still, there is the Western hist historiography, as you call it, still pervades our thinking of viewing the world, at least in the West. Well, I it's think, I, I, yes, I think, but I think, you know, I think that history is always subject to misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. And whether it's uh, propaganda or nationalism or uh, national pride, you know, all of these things tend to distort. So the question is, how do we write history that um, engages people honestly and authentically, and and lets them take pride in their past, but doesn't um, do so at the expense of the truth? Thank you. Liz.